Hi, Sanjana. So lovely to see you after so long. It's so good to see you too. How how has everything been? Yeah, well, it's been absolutely uh, tremendously exciting times, I must say. I think the last three years, all our work just became even more richer than before. And, uh, you know, our, our agendas are normally around change and around high performance culture building. Uh, this is when organizations are absolutely rife for these kind of uh, sort of agendas. So, yeah, have been very, very exciting times, snowed under with work, but not <laughs> complaining because it's just all been so good. Well, that's amazing. And in fact, I mean, I could imagine you'd have so much to tell us and share with us, um, especially after the pandemic era. There must have been so many changes and I'm sure that disruptions and progress. But tell me something about what you think the experience of organizations has been after the post the pandemic era for you personally. Yeah. So I think that it's uh, like I said, they are very exciting times. Uh, the pandemic has been like a live classroom and it has compelled everyone to go back to the drawing board uh, to be able to question many paradigms uh, and assumptions of the past. So I think it's done everyone a great job in terms of rethinking. So I think lots of opportunities for rethinking, recasting, uh, spotting new opportunities in the market, using technology to be able to upgrade uh, services to both customers, um, you know, I think a realization that you can't take talent for granted yeah. and that you must have a mechanism and a very solid value proposition to be able to keep employees going. Um, this whole paradigm that, you know, you're the employer and therefore, uh, you know, you're doing everyone a favor by giving them a job. I think there's that paradigm or even the command and control style of dealing with people. Hmm. I think there's a lot of rethought around, uh, you know, the way in which you come across and the way in which you kind of manifest leadership within organizations has undergone a very significant change. So overall, what are we finding organizations really do? I think I'm by and large really excited about uh, how organizations are having the courage to move away from tired strategies and yeah. instead look at strategy um, in smaller time frames of 18 months or 24 months, or perhaps 36 months, to be able to say, what can we do now? Yeah, what do we have here? Uh, what opportunities are, are we missing, right? Uh, how can we revisit our own lens to be able to perhaps view things in perspective? Uh, what are the value creation journeys which we just let slip in the last couple of years? And, and the disruptions that you're experiencing have not really been only the last three years. I think you saw the mother of all upheavals in the last uh, three years. Absolutely. Uh, you know, you've actually been seeing disruptions for over a decade now. And so, you know, how well have we responded to these disruptions? Because I think everyone got sharper with this crisis. And, uh, and I think the idea now is to be able to say with the pandemic settling down, what are the opportunities we have to be able to revisit uh, strategies? Mm -hmm. I think what I what I'm also seeing in the in our work is that organizations are, are more open and uh, to be able to experiment and to be able to drive change. I think this is a very positive shift that I'm seeing across uh, industries, which is let's just even if we didn't do it ever, let's do it now. Or if we didn't do it well, let's try it again. Maybe we didn't get something right. And that change is a very wide world word because it also means that you're looking, you're open to relooking at your structures, you're open to looking, relooking at your uh, talent, you're open to relooking at your leadership. And I think organizations have bitten the bullet and taken some really, really tough decisions, uh, particularly in the last, um, you know, 24 months to 36 months in terms of the quality of leadership they believe they require for the future. So I think this whole orientation towards talent and culture and wanting to be future ready, I think is a very welcome uh, sort of shift that we're seeing uh, inside organizations. But I think that I must admit, this is a mixed bag, Sanjana. So you have, you know, group of uh, organizations which are still in denial, uh, which want to go back to business as usual. You know, the minute the pandemic settled, they want to go back to March of 2020 and want everything to go back to the way it used to be because that is the familiar space and you don't want to deal with the uh, unfamiliar. I think uh, the fixed mindset challenge that, um, that individuals have, and I'm not gonna say it's just leadership, it's just across the board, 
uh, I think has come very significantly in the way of many organizations using this disruption in a meaningful manner. And what I mean by that is the ability to be able to make the effort to learn new things, the ability to not look very good uh, when you don't know something, for example, technology. And yeah. so most of the leadership across organizations are migrants to technology, uh, you know, notwithstanding which kind of industry. And I think that, uh, you know, there has to be a sense of uh, courage and, um, and sort of uh, fortitude, mental fortitude to want to lead in an environment where many things are unfamiliar. And I think that's, uh, that, you know, you have an equal share of companies which are large, which have also gone back to uh, old times. Uh, there are new economy companies as well, which are struggling with leadership that can adapt and adjust and change because finally they're the ones who are giving direction within organizations. So, uh, you know, I think that kind of um, uh, sort of preparation to be able to find their arms around disruption is extremely um, sort of important and also to not to be prepared to not look very good in the interim while you are trying to drive that change so i must say it's a mixed bag there having said that uh, i think the the common theme that i find across and this is literally across large size mid-size small size companies is that you want to be high performing now this this yeah. kind of sort of focus and determination to want to be high performing uh, is not new. It used to happen uh, in the pre-pandemic era as well. But in the new environment, uh, in the new economy, uh, there is no choice but to be high performing. I think some of the organizations are motivated by wanting to catch up uh, with lost time. Um, some of them are basically, uh, you know, know there are opportunities in the environment and they have not uh, leveraged these opportunities well enough, so they want to go after this. Uh, some of them want to do this, uh, you know, because they know there's so much of loss of productivity. Uh, yeah. There is, yeah, there has just been, especially in organizations uh, that have had challenges in the way in which they get the cadence in which they kind of execute and they get people to perform. Uh, you know, it, the the pandemic has been an era of low productivity, even if uh, most organizations manage to be able to resurrect some semblance of order. I think over a period of time, there is no denial in the fact that there have been many pockets of loss of productivity, loss of leveraging opportunity, uh, loss of becoming higher performing than they could have been. And I think there has been a fatigue that has set in, uh, particularly in the last 12 months. Uh, so I think there is this whole uh, catch up game now, which is, you know, I want yeah. to be able to leverage when things are up and running. How, how well can I resurrect uh, my organization? How well can I bring in focus? Uh, within the organization, how can we make sure that everyone's productive and aligned and pulling in the same direction? We do a lot of work in the space of OKRs, which is objective key results. This is uh, a rage since um, Intel and, and Google and a whole lot of other companies used it to grow multiple X and been working actively with organizations, even through the pandemic, uh, helping them to grow through OKRs. And it's um, it's amazing what focus can do and it's amazing what pulling in the right direction can do. It's amazing what happens when everyone's engaged and learns the language of goals. So uh, all of that actually unfolding and unbundling in the context of wanting high performance. No, that's that's quite that's quite amazing. And, and you know, because you mentioned, uh, you know, struggles being something that's been central to organizations, not only in the post pandemic era, but even earlier. What would you say if you could specifically talk about struggles, um, struggles with high high performance? Uh, mm. What do organizations face the most? This has been um, this area has been an area of focus, uh, work, and expertise for me for several years because uh, you know almost over three decades I've been working with organizations around performance and high performance cultures and so on. And you ask a very interesting question around what are the impediments to high performance? And, uh, you know, I'll call out some of them and uh, I'd be surprised if it doesn't resonate for anyone who's listening to this. So I think to begin with, uh, you know, the, in our discovery, we do an area of work called uh, stories we tell ourselves about ourselves. Right. And every organization has a set of stories they tell themselves about themselves. For example, we're very innovative or we're a very, very creative organization that, uh, you know, uh, 
I mean, we're very human centric uh, or, you know, we're very good with execution. And, and oftentimes these paradigms of what are we really good at uh, have actually uh, been true at some point of time in the evolution of the organization. So it's not just imagined, but it remains delusional over a period of time because you may not have upheld that strength and you still believe it to be a strength. And I think I must say that in discovery, it's um, very bemusing to be able to unearth this because oftentimes we find the organization is anything but what it is that they're saying they really are. And I think that is an area of uh, focus and must be an area of um, concern for organizations because if you believe something to be a strength and it's not in fact, uh, then there's a whole body of work to be done, including uh, sort of, uh, you know, rewiring um, your entire thought process around what you want to do within the organization, how you want to go about solving problems, um, you know, how you want to uh, unleash value and how you want to basically manifest high performance. So there, there needs to be a lot of sort of rethinking and admission to what may actually not be working. So I want to talk about this first part, which is that a lot of the strengths organizations believe they have are not necessarily their strengths. And or more often than not, uh, what we end up discovering is that it's quite contrary to what the organization believes are, are their strengths. Um, I think it speaks volumes to me uh, on the disconnect that you can have between the top leadership and the team that's actually executing the front line. And oftentimes you remain delusional. You don't know of the truth because you're not as well connected to be able to continuously garner data or remain communicative with people um, across levels. It's mm -hmm. typically a phenomenon between within large organizations, which have really scaled up in a very short period of time, where the leaders have remained trapped in the paradigms of the past and are not in touch with the realities of what's really going on uh, with the troops down there. So is this just like a lack of communication? Uh, is, it, is it just laziness? Is it, how does that, why does that end up happening? So I think that, you know, when you scale up really fast and you have lots of people who kind of come into the organization over a period of time, um, I think it's interesting to be able to figure what are the roles people are playing across the organization. And so is that well defined? Uh, has it just organically uh, evolved? Uh, you know, are you, uh, you know, what role, for example, does the mid management play? You know, mm. uh, in many organizations, it's a frontline that's achieving everything in the mid, mid management is playing like a consolidator role to make sure things are happening and the top leadership believes that our job is basically strategizing and giving direction and managing senior stakeholders and other external stakeholders and so on and that whole ecosystem is is a job by itself and so they expect uh you know the mid management and they're they're the people managers and their teams to be able to take on uh you know the task of execution and performance um you know i've always maintained that you can delegate, uh, you know, uh, work, you can delegate work, you can give people instructions, you can give them direction, you can coach people, all of that, but you cannot delegate your leadership. Um, so leadership is something that people must experience down the line. They must know what you stand for. They must know what your expectations really are. What are your standards of performance? You can't allow all of that to dilute as you grow as an organization so to your to your point on why would they not know or why are they disconnected and i think it's because we just kind of start redefining organically what we believe we really need to do within the organization and it links back to our question on what are the impediments to high performance and the impediments to high performance um like i said uh you know start with not really knowing uh, what is happening in the execution rhythm of the organization, the cadence of execution, what new challenges have emerged? Uh, what are the, uh, what is the, in the nature of, um, you know, customer intelligence, market intelligence, what is it that our people know in the front line, which we must be aware of if we are formulating strategies or we're mm -hmm. defining strategies or direction for the organization. So this disconnect has a huge price to pay, but I want to talk about, everyday rhythm of working within the organization which can create which can you know sort of manifest huge number of reasons for why the organization uh, does not work to its full potential for example marfa uh, so marfa is an acronym and it's an acronym for mistaking activity for performance uh, if you if you reflect on um, you know most organizations uh, you know, you'll find so long as there's something happening every day, right? It looks like everyone's really busy. So it's that difference between busyness and business. 
And so MAFA is uh, the full form of MAFA is mistaking activity for accomplishment. And so just so long as you're coming to work every day, everyone's seeming really busy. There are meetings to attend. There's market visits to go to. Uh, you know, the people are traveling to different places and so on. Um, you know, the, the, the large question that still needs to be answered is what did we achieve by being do, able to do all that we're doing? So in doing all that we're doing, what are we really doing? And so is this really manifesting into value creation? Is this manifesting into performance? Uh, is it manifesting into problem solving? What is this actually doing for us? Uh, and so you can you can go through days and, and, and believe that you're really, really busy and there's a lot happening, but that's just a lot of busyness and not business. So to be astute, around uh, around this uh, uh, you know concept of mafa is very very important for people managers so the tendency to micromanage for example hmm. and um, you know micromanaging is uh, a very common challenge people experience within organizations where their managers micromanage them everyone believes that they get basically don't get the elbow room that they really want within uh, organizations it's very common and so where does micromanagement really sort of emerge from? It emerges from primarily an insecurity that the person who's actually executing does not know or understand your standards. And so you're going to basically influence every step of what this person's doing in execution to make sure that they are in the right direction and delivering to the standards of quality that you are upholding. Now, you, so because you're worried, you kind of you believe it's OK to manage them in this manner. The truth is that most people, when they move into people manager roles, which is from being individual contributor to a people manager, most organizations don't offer people any training on what does it really mean from a mindset perspective? What does this really mean in terms of getting somebody else to perform? And I think this remains the largest gap in the way in which we allow people to take on people management positions. Hmm. The general perception in organizations is let's move people up if they've spent two or three years, they must now lead some other people. Otherwise, they will not get a sense of movement. So promotions are normally offered, early promotions particularly, are offered on a, almost on a platter to say that if we don't give this person a sense of movement, which means that we move them to the next level, we might lose them as talent because somebody else will give them that, that position uh, or that uh, opportunity. And so it's better we give it to them. And... Uh, it's seen as a low risk kind of challenge because they're leading another two, three people and that's all right. You know what I mean? Sometimes it can be a larger team, but typically it's they're going to lead two, three people who are really young and inexperienced, so it's fine. Actually, you've just doubled or tripled up your talent risk because they're inexperienced, they're ill-prepared, um, they are perhaps undercooked to be able to take on this responsibility. Now you're going to get them uh, perhaps disillusioned or confused or feeling... Uh, very uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, lonely and uh, and perhaps, um, you know, demotivated because they're not the great performers they thought they were. And you might lose them anyway. The other part is you might lose the other three who are reporting into them as well. So I've always maintained that the people manager role, the first one as well, and the next ones need to be given to people who've been prepared for this, who must know that this is a serious transition that when we allow you to move up, you're responsible for so many more salaries, which is the number of people who you're going to get to be able to leave. Yeah. And that it's your job to be able to represent the organization to these people and play that connector role, which will keep this talent going and keep this talent believing in us as an organization. And so whether you're a small size organization, mid size or large size, you need that. You need more people in the organizations who are advocates for the employer. Instead, what we end up doing is moving you know, underprepared people to these jobs and then frustrating them as well because they actually don't know the first thing about motivating other people. They're also in a space which we call occupational intimacy, which is only a manager, only the people manager is in the OI space, the occupational intimacy yeah. space. There's nobody else there. And so they represent the company or the organization to this group. And if they're not doing a good job, there's nobody else coming there to be able to motivate people on their behalf. So as a result, mm -hmm. you get a disconnect with the organization. So anyone who's uh, wondering about attrition at a junior level or at a mid level should relook at who they are allowing to become people managers uh, sort of inside the organization. So I'm going to come back to this micromanagement piece because we were talking about impediments to high performance. And so it comes from insecurity. It also comes from not knowing the next job. 
and normally you start managing people at the at the next level below below yourself because you do know that job you may not know the job above but you know the job below where there's a you lack of synergy there's a lack of synergy on the levels different levels that's of right. the organization yeah that's right and so instead of raising the bar to groom people to know the next level job you're mm. you're actually allowing for people to start getting involved with one job lower which is perhaps a space of familiarity and it actually reduces elbow room at the next level so micromanaging actually reduces performance within the organization because um you know uh, quantifiably this person's doing their own uh, job and the jobs of the people who are in the team so they're doing they they're producing um sort of a collective uh you know productivity which may uh, be suboptimal to what they could have done if this person was actually leading people and getting each one to be able to deliver performance mm -hmm. so micromanagement is definitely an impediment to high performance um there's also the parkinson's law right which is work expands to occupy time so uh you know whether you are producing x or you're producing 2x whether you ask to produce 3x you have just that many hours in a day and so if you don't find mechanisms to be able to work in a more productive manner and to keep improving the way in which you're working you can never actually enable the organization to grow most organizations the minute they have targets that are higher asking for more people and this might seem logically right that if you want to grow you know 1x in the coming year or 2x in the um, next 3 years you know we need to hire more people and uh, and to me um my my answer to that is go back to the drawing board to see how well you're utilizing the people you have on board right now and uh you know this kind of uh, uh, this tendency to be able to uh you know uh, very easily get head count the number of people that you want on board i know there is a lot more stringency around this within organizations right now but this again remains a mixed bag and uh, so there needs to be more accountability for why it is that you're asking people to be able to come in on board and to also be mindful about the fact that work does in fact expand to occupy time so a lot of people are suboptimal on their contribution and that kind of reduces their experience instead of enhancing their experience so contribution gets reduced in to, instead of contribution getting enhanced so it is definitely in the way uh, of high performance i also believe that there are lots of distractions in a workplace and you know currently workplaces have become the always on kind of 24 by 7 we can call each other any time and i think there was a lot of um you know backlash in the pandemic as well with people calling each other at 10 o'clock in the night 11 o'clock in the night um you know i know someone who was working um in an advertising agency and he said that his uh, client gets down to talking to them only after 12:30 uh, midnight so i'm just wondering about everyone's work life balance there you know what i mean and uh, so and especially if you're in services you needed to be ready to be able to take that call any time during the day and night and so on and i'm wondering about what's causing this right and i think there are a lot of distractions in the workplace um and um, you know i had a very nice sort of uh, image that explained this so uh, which talked again about what kind of a manager are you are you a manager who has like an umbrella style uh and by umbrella what i really mean is do you protect your team from distractions okay. and this is not protecting the team from experiences or from learning but protecting them from distractions or are you like a funnel style manager which means that you allow all the distractions to flow into your team now let me mention what kind of distractions i'm talking about so for example people just dropping in for a conversation or people asking for meetings at short notice or there being no outcomes of those meetings but you're supposed to go and attend those meetings and so on um mm -hmm. you know changes in priorities or if you are there are interdependencies there are changes in timelines lots of problems that can actually delay you and um you know distract you so i'm going to use two d's there delay and distract and so to what extent do people managers come in to be able to manage some part of that and of course people are adult and they can manage a lot of it themselves but they often don't because of where they are placed in the hierarchy and we're very very power centric uh, as organizations you know i keep repeating to my clients that the hierarchy uh, belongs to industrial revolution 1.0 and we are currently in industrial revolution 4.0 but we love the hierarchy and we love the power <laughs> distances and you know we love it when we have power and someone else doesn't and so in all fairness a lot of those distraction and delays that i'm talking about or, or constant change in agenda 
um, you know, uh, many people aren't empowered or don't feel empowered enough to push it back or to be able to manage it. And they might need their managers to be able to become a bit of that umbrella so that you don't throw all those variables onto the team to manage themselves. A lot of people in one-on-ones or through focus group discussions that we've had believe they wonder what contribution the manager is making to their jobs and to what extent is the manager enabling them to become high performing. Mm -hmm. Um, In one pulse survey uh, that was done for someone that I was coaching, um, they actually came back saying that our last quarter's performance had absolutely nothing to do with our manager. And there were a lot of them saying that, which is very interesting uh, for them to even perceive that and to be able to express that, to say that I don't believe, no, my manager has actually contributed to my performance. So good question to ask, which is at every level, what are we expecting? What is the contribution? Even if we've ended up having lots of people over a period of time, can we kind of just take stock on whose role is what and what are they actually contributing? And look, you know, it's not so complicated to be high performing. I always tell organizations, bring it down to a simple credo. For example, speed of problem solving is equal to speed of performance. So, you know, if I'm confused about what is performance, well, if you solve problems all the time for us, you're basically high performing, right? And who's the person who we want to select to be able to promote or to be able to identify someone who's high potential? Whoever is solving most number of problems within the organization. So kind of create a contagion of problem solving. And you'll oftentimes see that you can indeed improve performance dramatically. So And that's great for incentive building too, because that yeah. makes people want to reach that, you know, end goal and solve the problem. So it's, yeah. it's motivating for sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And also kind of gives you a sense of, a sense of accomplishment, isn't it? Because, exactly. uh, you know, it kind of goads you into action and you know people are natural problem solvers nobody likes to just sit on problems and if we've ended up creating a culture where it's okay and they're apathetic towards problems then it uh, basically requires to go back to the drawing board on who's leading them what is the style of of leadership what is it that is not motivating them to solve problems that are just lying around them you know i have a very interesting story to share so one of our clients uh, you know created something called they, they realized that people don't have the energy for problem solving so they created like a room uh, and they called it the um you know the problem solving room i'm just going to call it that they had a name for it but they called it it was basically the room where you come to with your problems and the idea was that oftentimes people sit with problems because it requires too many teams to be able to collaborate to be able to come together to find a solution so it's mm-hmm. not only yeah the solution is not just embedded in the place where people are struggling with it they may have noticed it they may have uncovered it they may have talked about it but the solution requires many more people to come in so some form of co-creating a solution using collective intelligence getting everyone to own the problem that kind of thing so this this group of very well-meaning uh, leaders within the organization said why don't we lead this by saying here's the room who's struggling with an execution problem come here We'll build, pull in whoever you need to. We'll use our our power to be able to help you solve this problem. And um, they decided to showcase what it meant, uh, you know, to use this uh, problem-solving room. And so uh, they picked a set of problems that they were already aware of, and they actually drew in teams and they sort of demonstrated it, you know, to show them, look, see how easy it is. Bring it forth. Don't hide it. Be transparent. Come and talk about it. We can solve these problems. And they did that for five days. And after that, they opened it up saying, all right, now we showed you all how to do it. Now bring us more problems. And guess what? No one came after the fifth day. Wait, right? really? No yeah, just no one showed up with any problem. And it's very interesting. And they were, they were intrigued with this. And, you know, we were working with them. They brought us in when they weren't getting those problems to say, there's yeah, definitely yeah. a cultural challenge here. Can you help us with this? Yeah. What is it going on? And there was just so much going on because which was le- which were legacy issues around culture. But I think more importantly, uh, you know, the paradigm that if you kind of even call out that you have a problem, uh, you'll get blamed or it will look like you underperform. So it's better to just cover it up and not talk about problems. And I don't know how many organizations are sitting with it. I think this was a very, very, uh, you know, courageous organization that decided to deal with this head on, let people know that if you think, if you're presuming something here, this is not true. We absolutely want to know you will not be blamed even if this problem didn't get solved for years on end. So please bring it forth. And I think oftentimes these challenges within organizations emanate from the fact that you do have tenured people 
you know, who have behaved in a particular manner over a long period of time. And they tell others that, you know, it's not worth it. Don't bring it up because you don't know and don't believe this problem solving room because you never know what the repercussion of this might really be. And I think it requires so lack of psychological safety, basically, yeah, to submit yeah. to the fact that we are having problems here or that someone's not cooperating or the interdependencies are not being managed because of which we are underperforming. So, yeah, That's we have some really fortunate because it's such a good endeavor. I mean, yeah. to, to have yeah. this problem solving room. Thank you.